let's investigate a special type of unitary transformation that can be written as the exponential of an anti-Hermitian operator. The kind of unitary transformation I'm talking about has this form. Our unitary transformation u is equal to e to the epsilon s. This epsilon is just here uh, to tell us the order of terms. So you can think of epsilon as just being a constant along for the ride. And we can set epsilon equal to 1 at the end, but this epsilon is going to be very useful in labeling terms and deciding which terms to keep and which terms to reject. So this is the form of the unitary transformation we're interested in. And we can write this in an equivalent form. This exponential is equivalent to the sum from some index, which we can call k, equal to 0 to infinity of epsilon s to the power of k divided by k factorial. And we can approximate this by taking a few terms in this series. So this is approximately equal to 1 plus epsilon s plus epsilon squared on 2 s squared. And we can include higher order terms. But in this video, I'm just going to go up to second order. So this is why it's really important to keep this epsilon here, because we can tell just by looking at a term what order it is. And if we're doing a second order approximation, we need to be consistent. We can't include higher order terms if we're rejecting certain terms. So with these types of approximations, you have to be consistent with what terms you reject. And you only reject the ones beyond a certain cutoff. So cubic and higher are going to be rejected in this video. Now, what we're going to do is let's take the, the uh, Hermitian adjoint of this unitary operator. And if we do that, that's going to look like this. u dagger is going to be equal to e to the epsilon s with a minus sign over here. That's because we're choosing s to be anti-Hermitian. And I'll write that property up in the top over here. So s dagger is equal to minus s. This property is called being anti-Hermitian. If it was Hermitian, this minus sign would not be here. It, we would have s equals s dagger. But this minus sign makes it anti-Hermitian. We could also redefine this operator uh, in terms of a Hermitian operator, and then we would have to introduce the imaginary unit i and minus i over here in these definitions. So that is an equivalent way of describing this property, or this, this type of unitary transformation. But in this video, I'm going to use the convention that s is anti-Hermitian. In other places, you might see uh, e to the is and e to the minus is also occurring. So keep in mind that that is an equivalent way of describing this physical system, but it is just using a different convention. You're just relabeling the operator that you're calling s. So now let's continue with this over here. How is this going to be different? Well, this sum is still going to be from k equals 0 to infinity. But up here, we're going to have minus epsilon s to the power of k. And we're going to divide by k factorial. So this is approximately equal to 1 minus epsilon s plus epsilon squared on 2 s squared. So you can see that we have a minus sign. So it's different from what we have up here. Here we have plus and here we have minus. All of the odd terms are going to have an extra minus sign. The even terms are going to remain unchanged. It's only the odd terms that will have this extra minus sign introduced. It's because we're, we're uh, taking the power of this minus 1, we're raising it to the power of k. So you have this sign flip occurring. And because we're doing a second order approximation, we're going to ignore those cubic terms. Now what I want to do is transform a Hamiltonian with this type of transformation. So we're using this transformation to go from, from one Hamiltonian to a transformed version of that Hamiltonian, which describes the same time evolution in a different frame. So let's do that down here. So we're going to have h prime, and h prime is equal to u h u dagger. We're transforming this Hamiltonian. And we're also making the assumption that this unitary transformation is time independent. If there was a time dependence, we would have an extra term that takes into account u dot. And u dot is the time derivative of this unitary transformation. 
So let's rewrite this in terms of this form with the exponential of the anti-Hermitian operator s. So this is equal to e to the epsilon s h e to the minus epsilon s. So we're sandwiching that Hamiltonian in between these two unitary operators, and that is allowing us to transform this Hamiltonian into this primed frame. And another thing that I'll write over here is, I'll just make it very clear that u dagger is equal to u inverse. Or in other words, u dagger, u uh, u dagger is the same as u dagger u, and that is the identity. So we just need to be very clear, this is the property of u, and this is the property of s. So by definition, I'm, def I'm defining these operators to have those properties. So now what we can do is we can take the second order approximation. We can substitute these terms and these terms and sandwich this h in between all of those terms. So let's do that over here. We're going to have an approximate form. Over here, we're going to have 1 plus epsilon s plus epsilon squared on 2 s squared. Then we have h in the middle. And this is followed by 1 minus epsilon s plus epsilon squared on 2. Then we have s squared. So this is just the second order approximation. If you wanted to go further, you would include higher order terms here and here. And that would just give you many more terms to deal with. But we're cutting it off, we're truncating, and we're only dealing with second order terms. So this term over here is actually zero order. So we have zero order because it's epsilon to the power of zero. This is first order because we have epsilon to the power of one. And this is second order because we have epsilon to the power of two. Anytime we see epsilon to the power of three or greater powers of epsilon, we're going to ignore those terms. So that's why I'm putting an approximately equal to sign over here. So let's expand all these guys out. So I'll put approximately equal to, let's see what terms we get. So first, we can have a look at the zero order uh, term. So we have one and one over here. If we sandwich this Hamiltonian between the two ones, that's just going to be the Hamiltonian itself. So the first step to transforming the Hamiltonian is taking the original Hamiltonian. And then we add extra terms, and they change the Hamiltonian slightly. So that is that comes from this term over here. Next, let's have a look at the first order terms. So those are terms that have epsilon to the power of 1. So you can see this term over here. We have s. And you can also see this term over here. If we combine this 1 and this s together, and if we look at this 1 and this s together, we're going to have all of the first order contributions. And you can see that when you combine this 1 and this s, there's an h in between. So you have s h. And then over here, you have h with a minus s. So we have minus h s. So that's going to give us plus epsilon. And first, we're going to have s h and then minus h s. You might recognize this form. This is the form of a commutator. So we're swapping these operators around. So those terms are the only first order contributions. You can see that uh, the s comes first over here with the plus sign, and then it's followed by h. And the minus sign comes when the h is first. So that's when we take 1 times h times minus epsilon s. And that accounts for this term over here. And I've just factored out the epsilon because these are both first order terms. Now let's have a look at the second order terms. Now we'll factor out a uh, factor of epsilon squared on 2 just for convenience. And let's have a look at which terms have epsilon squared. Well, if we take this term over here with s squared, and we combine it with this 1, we're going to have s squared times h times 1. So that's just going to be s squared h. And then we have another analogous term, which takes into account this term over here. So here, again, we have a plus sign, but it's the opposite order. We have 1 times h times s squared. So now we have h s squared. And there is one more term. It is a mixed term that contains s, h, and s. So what is it actually telling us? It's telling us to sandwich this h in between two s's. And there's also a minus sign because one of these terms has a minus and one of these has a plus. So we have a factor of 2 to cancel out this half. And we have s, h, s. OK, that is all of the second order terms. You can see that if we continued multiplying these guys out, we would get epsilon to the power of 3. And that is a cubic order term. 
And we're going to reject that because we're doing a second order approximation. Uh, I'll give you an example of, of that. If we were to combine one of these s squared terms with one of these first order terms, we would have epsilon squared, and over here we would have epsilon. That is epsilon cubed, and that is too small. It's small cubed, and we are rejecting those terms. If we wanted to do a cubic order approximation, then we would include those terms as well. But then it would make more sense to include more terms in these expansions as well. So for the second order approximation, these are all of the relevant terms. Now what I want to do is write these terms in terms of commutators. So what is all of this in terms of commutators? Well, this, by definition, is the commutator of s with h. But what about this big mess over here? Well, this big mess is a little bit complicated, but we're going to work out and we're going to see that this can be written as nested commutators. So I'll write this underneath. This is actually equal to h plus epsilon times the commutator of s with h. That is by definition what this is. Then we're going to have epsilon squared on 2 times the commutator of s with the commutator of s with h. You can see there's a commutator within a commutator. That is what this big mess is equal to. And I will explicitly show why that is the case now. So let's write this in a more suggestive form. First, let's have a look at s squared h. We can write that as s s h. Then let's have a look at one of these copies of s h s. We can write that as minus s h s. Then let's have a look at this term. Here we have h s squared, and that is the same as h s s. And then we have another copy of these guys because there's a coefficient of two, and that's going to be minus s h s. So these two terms are the same as these two terms over here, and s h s and s h s, those guys can be brought together to make this term. Now let's do some groupings. We can see that over here we have an s on the left hand side and an s on the left hand side. And then we can group this sh and this hs together. We can do a similar thing for these two terms. hs can be grouped together and this sh can also be grouped together. And we have an s on the right hand side. And we can write this as being equivalent to s on the left times the commutator of s with h. You can see that there is a commutator over here. Here we have sh followed by minus hs. That is the same form that we had over here. And that's what we have defined to be the commutator. So when you have these square brackets with a comma in the middle, that is notation that tells you this commutator over here. So that is just shorthand notation for all of this. This is standard notation in quantum mechanics. Now, let's have a look at this other term over here. We have plus the commutator of h with s. You can see first we have hs, and then we subtract off sh. And then we have s on the right hand side. And because the commutator is, uh, has this anti-symmetry property, we can swap these guys around and introduce a minus sign. So that's going to give us, I'll write this over here, if we swap these guys around, we're going to have s times the commutator of s with h minus the commutator of s with h times s. And you can see that now this commutator is actually acting as an operator in another commutator. So this is equivalent to s with the commutator of s with h. So we have a commutator within a commutator. You can see it, it satisfies the same pattern. If you replace this a uh, commutator of s with h with this h over here, it's exactly the same format. But instead of an operator itself, it is a commutator of operators. And we can call this a nested commutator, or we could also call this an iterative process, where we iterate and we add more commutators inside of those commutators. So if we were to look at cubic order terms, you would have a triply nested commutator. You'd have a commutator inside of a commutator inside of a commutator. And this keeps going on with higher order corrections. If you want to add more corrections, you will see more and more commutators. So this is actually a special result of the Baker-Campbell-Hausdorff formula. And the Baker-Campbell-Hausdorff formula is a very general result in quantum mechanics that allows us to manipulate exponentials of operators. 
So because of the non-commuting nature of a lot of operators in quantum mechanics, you can't simply use exponent laws in quantum mechanics. It's because the commutators of operators are not always going to be zero. So what you have to do is you have to follow these identities. You have to substitute these identities, which have been proven in general to work, and then that allows you to manipulate the exponentials of operators when you multiply exponentials of operators as well. And that is what we're doing over here. We're multiplying exponentials of operators. We're actually sandwiching it in between another operator. So that is why you need to use this special case of the Baker-Campbell-Hausdorff formula. And we've just derived that up to second order by manipulating these operators and expanding them out in the second order Taylor approximation. So hopefully this over here makes sense, and you can see why we have a nested commutator appearing over here. We're going to be using this form of the transformation of the Hamiltonian in the next video in the quantum mechanics playlist. And in that video, we're going to be using uh, transformations that have this form to do the schrieffer wolf transformation. And that's going to allow us to diagonalize Hamiltonian, uh, a, a Hamiltonian of a system using perturbation theory. And we're also going to be using a second order approximation. You can find all the videos in the quantum mechanics playlist if you click over here.